Hi everyone! We are talking about one of your favorite subjects, anxious attachment, which Elliot and I covered in our last, uh, well, two podcast episodes again uh, ago, 165, okay? Um, and Elliot is coming in, and then we will re, yep, go live with, and then Lisa's coming. Hi, thanks for joining us, everyone! Hi! It's great. So excited. Hello. How are we doing? Good, good, good. All right. We got some folks joining us and we will, let's see if we can request Lise. I think the request goes like this. Hi, everyone. I'm waving at whoever I can. And then, um, let's see. L-E-I-S-S. -S -S. There we go. So then, I don't know if that did a request that got her in here or not, but I know she's up to speed. She did a nice little video that we shared yesterday. Hey, everyone. I'm going to wave everybody. Um, also, probably should let everyone know. Hey, Elise. Perfect. And she, Elise, send us a request. I think that's the easiest way. Or maybe you just did. Let's Don't see. send me. Send Karen. What's that? Send Don't request. send me one. What's that? Send Karen one, not me. No, right. I think we, I did, I think I successfully sent yes. us a request. <gasps> Hi! Here too. <laughs> Yay! Family time. Right. Oh, it's so good to see you. Good to see you guys. Oh my gosh, it's so great! I'm so thrilled that everyone's joining us. Um, Lee set it up so beautifully with your videos yesterday. That was perfect. <laughs> perfect. Um, I'm just waving to everybody who's joining us. You guys know we're talking about anxious attachment. And as Lise explained yesterday, this is basically because she listened to Elliot and my conversation, had some really interesting thoughts about anxious attachment in terms of how intimacy develops in modern dating. Mm -hmm. And it was such great questions that I, I didn't, I was like, we gotta talk to Elliot about this. You know? <laughs> we Sounds gotta make good. this a round table. <laughs> Yeah, and um, specifically, just to set the stage, and then I'll let you guys go for it. Um, I, I think specifically we're looking at intimacy development and that anxious attachment component and also the modern dating, which is in some ways accelerated, and that's understandable. Also, Lisa said, you know, ain't nobody got time to be waiting eight months to figure out if we're a fit. So some information needs to come sooner than later. So that's the kind of uh, the, the setting the stage for what we're looking at today. Do you guys have any first thoughts before we are off and running? Well, one I have is where is Lise in the Anderson birth order? <laughs> okay. is truly your so, younger sister, Karen, you always wanted a younger sister. Do you have one now? She, okay, she's younger than me. But I feel like you're an old soul. I feel I, like I look up to you. So I think I'm still the baby in the family. I think, I think you at least have the middle children. I, that would, that no, would make sense. I, I exert no qualities of a middle child, but like every quality of an older child. So just saying. Yeah, well, yeah. my brother's got that one down pretty strong. Right? <laughs> Not any room in the end there. But you would be the first girl then in the family birth order. So that would make you have some of those older, oldest qualities. So... I don't know. I just see, I don't know. I, I, I definitely, I think you have some middle child because you, I mean, you were, you're recovering people pleaser and that yeah. can be a middle child um, yeah. a trait. That's so. true. <laughs> Start myself in. <laughs> <laughs> so we've established that at least any kind of uh, introductory words before we get moving and shaking. I'm just really excited to have this conversation for so many reasons, not only like for professional interests, but also like personal motivations. Because as a 40 year old single woman dating now, like back on the dating scene with children, I can't even believe how even in a short period of time, like even a couple of years, it seems like a brand new world because we have so much access to each other all the time. And I might segue into a later conversation later, but the energy, energy dynamics are completely off. It's like this wild west of nobody really knows how to date or how to court. Mm -hmm. But as I was waiting for this to start, I got a text message from somebody that I've been kind of chatting with saying, forgive me, um, you have that look, I'd love to taste you. And I'm like, <laughs> so this is dating in 2021. 
Oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Man. So oh. there's the reframe. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of good lines in my day. I never used that one. <laughs> it's not going to work. So I don't think you missed out on anything. That's good. Well, I think I, I'll start on one aspect, and I don't pretend to know what the dating scene is from experience base as a man, mm -hmm. being married 32 years and not being on the sites appropriately so. <laughs> uh, but I certainly work with college students and hear about it all the time. Yeah. And I recognize, I think that that neutrality of the roles, positions, and movements, Lise, you're explaining, is very confusing mm -hmm. and, and is very difficult and in my opinion, and I'm an old soul by age and heart, <laughs> that often means a, a distribution of the process that has to be a little bit more orchestrated mm -hmm. or um, prescribed a little bit, which I know does not sound fun for our instant age, our insta live age of <laughs> relational dynamics. I, I'm so impressed with myself for even being on here that I, I can figure this out. I'm happy, but. And, and, and at least I think then all, all the more importantly then, our preconceived belief system, our belief in self, our, our belief in our understanding, what we need, what we receive, what we want, how we process, how we communicate, our expectations for a relationship, uh, all of those things I think even come more stronger into play due to this current reality in the dating market. <laughs> So can I ask a question, but illustrated, I'm going to illustrate with a personal example as it relates to anxious attachment and dating. So when you posted Karen the other day about like characteristics of anxious attachment, I think, I think the first one is like desire to merge fully with one person. I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Like that's number one on the list. I feel at this point in my life, I have done so much work uh, and joyfully so. Like some of it was not joyful, but the end result is joyful. Of really coming to know and love and appreciate the woman that I am. And I really deeply desire, as you both know, to share that with someone. And that does feel like a merging of two into oneness, right? And I don't know how on earth I'm supposed to do that because I'm so self-aware I can kind of tell almost instantly if they if this relationship is going to have legs to grow or not. And I don't think that's a judgment of or, or lack of intimacy. It's, it's this deep intuition and self awareness of like, Oh, yeah, no, this is this has potential or 100% does not have potential. So I think the the question or the the gray zone is how do you consciously slowly build intimacy, while also being in in true knowing of what it is you deeply desire. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Let me, let me give one illustration that might um, tickle your funny bone and also give you some insight. The very first sermon I gave when I became a full-time pastor out of my counseling realm, so in a new field, new area, hadn't done it before, my mentor came, who just passed away in May, and we just uh, did the ceremony for him in October. My mentor came, always took fervent notes. He had a, a divinity degree from Yale, and so his intellect uh, availability was very high. And so I preached for 55 minutes and we got done afterwards. And I was looking forward to what he said. And he said, well, you don't have to tell him everything, you know, every week. <laughs> <laughs> and it really stuck with me. It was a, that's the way he talked anyway. And it really was a profound moment to recognize the sense of urgency I had in this new position, this new role to give every single theological bullet I had planned and ready to go for the last 25 years and deliver it all on one Sunday. And it, it just helped me pace my own disclosure, my own illuminations, my own revelations, my own spirit building, uh, and to recognize it's a process and a journey. And sometimes then for a year, there would be a particular message I felt the Lord give me that I didn't deliver because it didn't feel right at that exact time. And, and so, Lise, you are, I think you're quite right in your own self-assessment. I, I don't mean to do Instagram live therapy, but if you're willing, I'm diving in. <laughs> <You're correct. laughs> I, I think you're, uh, you're, you're right. You are super aware. You are super conscious, and you're analytical, and you're intellectual, and you're beautiful, and you're strong. You got this entire package, which is fantastic. And I think at times you're worried that you're just too much for somebody. Mm -hmm. And you're not. You're exactly the way the Lord designed you. 
you're exactly how much someone needs some man in particular and so you're right your pacing might be different than the average 20 year old 30 year old pacing that needs to take place and that disclosure element about how much is too much you're so able to go into present past and future all in one beautiful linear experience that not that many people can but at the same time you have to stay fully present in your connections and in your community and allow the present conversation even if it's somewhat platonic in nature and not depth of intimacy be the joy of that initial experience so i don't i don't think the right man and the right prescription of what kind of man you're looking for would automatically say oh i can't disclose a lot of these deep powerful things about myself well first of all they're going to probably check you out online everything and see half the stuff so they're already going to know uh, but secondly that's part of your aura. that's part of who you are is this powerful depth of soul so i think it's not only how much you disclose it's how you disclose it are you disclosing in a freedom of just sharing a piece of who you are well you could sit down with some guy and it could take a month for him to figure out totally who you are because there's so much to you yeah. so that's why i think it's about the nurturing of the pace uh -huh. and the nurturing of the spirit and the soul release without being fake or not being authentic that still allows what you need to feel that depth and connection so you can also make a good read on whether this man can enter into that zone with you without potentially disclosing too much of yourself where you feel all vulnerable or all of a sudden you feel anxious mm -hmm. uh, about that potential attachment when there was no reason to have that anxiety yet mm -hmm. so i danced around a little bit but i hope you recognize a little bit what i was talking about oh yeah i think that's really beautifully said really really beautifully said and appreciate everything you said in a very deep way as you know um and i really love that that turn of phrase of really just slowing the pace and that that is a conscious choice that is intentional and if we created um, this universe in which we now live or exist with so much access to consciously be like we're just going to press pause and we're just going to slow that down the the other side of that coin is like oh great so when you find the right person of course that makes sense of course i can say like in my bio um i prefer phone over text and the right person is gonna like respect that boundary and they're gonna call me i was gonna say but <laughs> but and and in the meantime there are all those people in in between who who can't show up like that who can't rise to that that standard who can't meet that boundary for example and so dating becomes like, what if I just want physical intimacy? And I need sure. over in the meantime, before we can get to that depth of emotional intimacy. And the paradox is, of course, which you guys talked about on the podcast, that if you, you delve into a physical intimacy first, you've completely flipped the script on the, like, the natural order of things and how getting that physically intimate with somebody then creates a state of being anxious. And I think this is pretty gendered, but especially being a woman, right? It's Absolutely. like, oh, we're so intimate. We just spent the night in bed together. It's like, wow, and now you're, you've totally disappeared. And I'm still thinking about you three years later, for example. It's, yeah. it's such a funny dance. Yeah, and I think, Karen, you're gonna have to interrupt us because we're gonna get going. So <laughs> it's just I, get going. I, that's what I was hoping for. I'm uh, here to I will be trying to just for people who know if you do have a question because some questions are coming in the comments there's a little question bubble with a question mark in it hit your question there when these two have a, a moment then we'll take some questions but so I'm just moderating here so go ahead Ellie. all right so I, I think all of us are wired and designed by God for intimacy and a depth of intimacy to fully be known and fully know other people first and foremost with the Lord himself and so that desire you're talking about, Lise, I think is universal, but because of father wounds and mother wounds and family of origin trauma, we kind of turn it off. We're like afraid to be fully known or afraid to try to fully know somebody. Mm -hmm. And so for someone like yourself and like myself and Karen, who've worked so hard to intentionally heal, intentionally grow, and then take what we've learned and help others through it as well, there's an insatiable intimacy desire i can't i can't get to know enough people fully it's like a compulsion and addiction 
thankfully at this stage in life, it's at least 90% for the benefit of the positive, not any kind of wicked, more egotistical, you know, maniacal kind of scenario. But I, I think you have that as well, Lise, that desire you do so well with your, your community and your team and even uh, Karen and I in the context of our family. Uh, and so how do you take that into an environment, into a dating environment and hook up culture uh, and the whole context of let, yeah, let's knowingly intentionally flip the script and then see what happens. And that's where I think that anxious attachment piece again can serve us well. And for someone as bright and as uh, self-connected and authentic as you are, you probably got to at least listen to your instinct a hundred times more than the average woman. No offense to all the listeners uh, watching. Uh, but you have to probably know right off the bat, feel the instinct, feel the movement. And if you are truly wanting a physical intimate connection without the strings attached, mm -hmm. well, to be fully apparent and transparent about that and recognize if the man is there with you as well, he can probably do that, compartmentalize it and not have attachment organization come through it where you will not. Yes. Like I said, a hookup culture for a woman is different than a hookup culture for a man. I'm embarrassed by that as a man, but that's just the reality of our, our, our human being nature and gender differentiation and, and masculine female energy. And so though I totally understand when a young woman talks to me about, I just have the desire for this physical intimacy. What do you think about the hookups that I'm involved with? Is this going to help me or prepare me for marriage? I have to tell them, no, it won't. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately for many men, they can get away with that and truly flip the switch later and become a pretty good husband and, and parent. And I just don't see women able to take that kind of baggage of pain, all these mini micro attachments with them in the same manner. I was thinking the other day, I don't, I don't drink anymore. I've been sober for about four years, but I was thinking about that conscious decision to be like, okay, this is not going to be a relationship, but it could be like a, a part-time relationship or it could be like a relationship for a night that it's like preparing yourself for a night of drinking, that this is going to be so fun. It's going to feel so good. And the next day it's going to suck it yeah. is going to be really painful and I, it's like this emotional hangover or this intimate hangover of like wow that that was a temporary high and yeah. at a certain point maybe i'm answering my own question or i don't know off the top yeah. of my head um, and the attachment with that high what yeah and like is it worth it and i know this is going to feel awful so what's more worth it feeling awful then or feeling awesome now right for sure Juicy. What, uh, Karen, have you seen thoughts, Karen, but I didn't know if you're, if you need to answer questions or you want us to respond to something in particular. Um, if you want to keep going, keep going, then we'll get into the questions. But there, yeah, because there's some that people submitted over the last 24 hours because I put the question sticker. So just trying to ignore um, the rolling because I have no idea what it means. So I'm just trying to ignore it. <laughs> okay. so that, that is people who are watching and they're asking some questions in the, this little comment section that's scrolling up. Sometimes I'm able to read all those, answer them simultaneously, but with three of us, it's a little bit harder to do, to multitask. So I would, yes, yeah, suggest if anyone has a comment or a question they really want us to be able to address, go to that little button with the question mark below. Do you have any that came in in advance that we can, uh, we can talk about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they probably are coming in. Let me just take a look while you guys, um, yep, yep, questions from stories. All right, um, let's look at this. I like this one right here. Yeah. Can, uh, can you guys see it as well? No. Oh, you can't. Okay. So this, uh, she's asking about anxious attachment. Does it mean you don't feel worthy to choose a partner? She says, I have lots of anxiety overall. So when it comes to anxious attachment, is that essentially a manifestation of a lack of worthiness, which we've, you guys both spoke to on my podcast very recently. So I would encourage anyone to check those, out those episodes. Lisa, you you want to go? Yeah. No, I want you to, to go first. <laughs> I'd say certainly when we have anxiety as a general condition or a general manifestation of our spirit and soul, by all means, it's going to carry through another relationship, just like it carries through at work, carries through in our neighborhood, our community, our activities, our church. Of course, that can follow. But it doesn't necessarily mean then that that anxiety that's being produced from relationship means the relationship bad. Just like we wouldn't say, well, I have anxiety, but I'm doing really well at work, but maybe I should quit work because I'm anxious at work. Well, if you're anxious all the time and anxious at work, it's just a manifestation of the anxiety. So I think there's reasons then to identify, is the anxiety in the relationship separate or different than my normal anxiety? And how is that coming about 
and in what capacity? Is it obsessive worry about not being able to be yourself because you do feel this lack of worth, this lack of validation we talked about, or this fear of being truly self because will it be rejected like I was rejected by my mom or my dad or whatever those family of origin stories are. And, and so it's trying to, it sounds kind of funny, but it's trying to decipher different styles of anxiety or different manifestations of anxiety. So you can kind of look for ways to work on both. And certainly a secure relationship can calm certain anxieties in life. But a good relationship doesn't, mat doesn't automatically take all anxiety of life away. And sometimes we desire such a perfect partnership and anything less than absolute perfection makes us anxious. And that's a little bit of a, a validation issue more than it might be about the guy or the woman. I love that. I would add to that. And I think, yeah, I think you spoke about this in the podcast as well. At what point does it become a self-fulfilling profit? And when you and I did a recent podcast, we talked about, because I'm like, this is very de rigueur for me, that the concept of manifestation has been so wildly misappropriated, particularly in the relationship sphere or space. So there is a tendency or a tendency to promote a message that like, if you work, then you get the partner, right? So if you do this, then you get the cookie, just like I trained my dog. The only glitch in that system is that people aren't algorithms. Mm -hmm. And while our behavior is pretty predictable in a lot of different ways, it's also very open to the mystery, the universe of God, of fate, of destiny, whatever you want to call it. So I feel like there's so much tendency of like, well, if I am this way, then I therefore must be manifesting the wrong kind of person. I, like, I will tell you, we're probably close to $120,000 later of like self healing work. I have not manifested the right person because the bloody time I didn't swear because the bloody timing, has, the timing has not been right. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really difficult, but I would argue it critical to be in this conscious state of like, I can be doing everything right and still not get the right person at, at, yet. Or yeah. I can be a person who does experience anxiety and I can still attract a really wonderful partner because we're not as simple as we're often, I think, like led to believe that we are. Amen. Yeah. Thank you for speaking to that. Yeah. I think I, I echo everything you guys are saying. I, it's, it's concerns me that like, that this notion that because I, it's twofold, like you said, Lise, it's the idea of like, well, you got to do the work, you got to love yourself, and then he's going to show up, right? And that's, of course, I take issue with that in my book as well. But at the same time, of course, we're going to be growing and changing. But then, I, I mean, I just submit to everyone, all those years that people said I was too much, I got emotional earlier, Lise, when Elliot uh, referred to the, um, the, the fact that you might at sometimes wonder if you're just too much for a guy. And, and yeah, you know, you're too much for the wrong guy. You're too much for all those wrong guys. Mm -hmm. And I heard that too. You're intimidating with your PhD, right? And I got emotional because I, I resonate with that. But the idea that you are doing this or that, the other, and it, just a reminder, everyone, my husband was married to someone else. And when the marriage finally was done, he showed up and I was 42 and here we are happily ever after. All those years of like, what am I doing wrong? Or maybe I got to do this course and this course and this. And people try to sell me that stuff, you know, take this $3,000 course because obviously you're blocking something. Sometimes it's just life, like you said, Lise. It's sometimes it's just, there's, there's other realities out there. We want to control so desperately. Yeah. Don't and can I, speak to, uh, can I speak to that as well, too? So in this, rather than a results-focused context for relationships, there's also this idea in our human nature that the relationship didn't work out, we failed. And it's just not true. Sometimes we meant to fail. You know, we don't do that. If we work at Taco Bell after six months and then we hate it and we move on, we're not like, I was a complete failure serving tacos. We're like, no, I just wanted to do a different job. I want to get out of retail. But in relationships, sometimes we recognize something or we know something. I've been corresponding back and forth with some of your listeners about this, Karen, this, this week. Uh, recognizing this isn't the right scenario. This isn't the right man. This isn't the right relationship. And yet I can't pull out because if I do, I'm a failure and then things are going to get really hard. And it's this conscious like separation of soul saying, well, in some context, I guess I deserve this really difficult, awful relationship because if I admit that it's wrong or it's not going well or it's not blessing me or benefiting me, 
I'm some failure. And I'm like, no, it's the exact opposite. You're bright, you're aware, you're conscious, you're choosing life and happiness and joy. And of course, spiritually, you're trusting God to take care of these next steps and not feeling like you can control every single piece of every single relationship and every single dynamic. It's impossible. You can't do it. It just drives you absolutely insane. This is a conference. I would like to get a large megaphone and just like find the nearest soapbox. I write about it in a book. I've lived it personally. And on the other side of divorce, I can tell you the only, the only failed marriage is staying in a marriage in which you were desperately unhappy. That's it. Like nobody, you know, use the job, the, the example of a job. When you buy a house, most people aren't like, this is the house I will live in until they take my dead body to the living room. It's like, that might happen. And for some people that might happen with your house, with your relationship, whatever. The statistics tell us that is not the reality. And the statistics have been at about a 50% divorce rate in first marriages. And I think it's like 60%. Yeah. And that's not like a, a like an outlier stat. That's a pretty, pretty even keeled stat for a number of years. So being able to reframe what we think is a failure versus a success, suddenly we're looking, and you said this, Elliot, like we're looking at it as the experience itself versus the result. That is still sometimes hard for me to accept mm -hmm. in my life. I get that. Because it, when you don't have the result, it can be a really painful process. Sometimes, sure. right? Painful destination or um, process but really tapping into like the end goal is not like, Oh, perfect. There's a ring on my finger. I'm out. It's what am I learning from this experience? What am I learning from the experience I thought I was going to have versus the experience I am having? There's so much more to it and success versus failure are not these like binary concepts of, of simplicity. Yeah. And if your results focused and you find a good man and it's all about getting married, mm -hmm you can get into marriage with a good man and be miserable mm -hmm. because it was all about the result. It wasn't about the experience. It wasn't about the growth. It wasn't about interdependence. It was, and so it's just like the fact that we spend what, like average, like 75 grand on weddings. And we spend about 150 bucks on premarital instruction or counseling. It's the same concept. We get so stuck into this seven hour day, which is cool. I love weddings. Of course, I'm a raging extrovert, but we get stuck on that and do little preparation and wonder why we're disappointed six months in. And thinking, well, I thought it was supposed to be more than this. Well, it is. It is supposed to be more than that. And it's that, that process of experiencing and growing. And you're not the same person you, you know when you're dating someone in the first month compared to where you are 6, 10, 20, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get on a different tangent there, so I'll stop there. <laughs> um, someone asked if this was being recorded. Yes. So we will save this. And I believe I'll be able to share it with Elliot and Lise and they can share it with their platforms. And I'm also going to uh, upload it to YouTube. So I'm trying to do a little bit over at YouTube as well. Just, uh, you're a tech um, now. What's, what's that? You're a tech wizard now. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I tried this new feature. Lisa's like, where'd you learn how to, I don't know. I saw somebody share something about being able to schedule this live in a way. And anyway, another question. Let's check one out here. Um, so just, Straight up, we've addressed this to a degree, but just flat out, how can someone with an anxious attachment ever feel secure in a relationship? How, can they have a secure relationship? Can they grow? Can they move? I mean, I think that's something that I take issue with and my community knows is I take issue with all these labels. I'm very quick to, to challenge when someone comes to me, I have anxious attachment. I'm like, well, do you? I, um, I want them to, to consider that maybe They've had a season where they felt anxiously attached. Or as Elliot and I said in the last podcast episode, sometimes you're anxious in the relationship because it's not the right relationship for you. And you have every reason to listen to those emotions. My concern is that when we label, when we're always diagnosing, then we take that, we, oftentimes it'll be a self-fulfilling prophecy. We'll step into that way of behaving because we've taken on, I have anxious attachment. So if I meet some guy and he doesn't text me 17 times the next day, I'm gonna lose my mind. It's my anxious attachment, right? So we live up to a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And at the same time, the other problem with this labeling is that we sometimes will then end up dismissing our emotions that we need to listen to. They are telling us something very important, but we're like, oh, I feel this anxiety with this really bad guy who treats me horribly, but it's not just my anxious attachment. It's not my rational 
healthy part of me, protective part of me is telling me, mayday, mayday, get out of this abusive relationship. Preach it, sister. Woo! <laughs> I my coffee. She was going to work. I forgot what I was going to say. I got so enthralled with your presentation. <laughs> May I add something? Absolutely. Okay. okay, so other side of the label coin, because everything that you said is so true. And the other side, sometimes a label is a really beautiful thing, I think. And I, I wrote this in my book too, but my own family of origin story, like if anybody is primed to have like a clinical anxious attachment style, it's this girl. Mm -hmm. And so for me, knowing that, and I have really high EQ, I'm really sensitive. I'm very, like, I'm very much a feeler. I'm very emotional. All of that lumped into one. For me, I have to give it a label to like, to just kind of call it what it is. And so I refer to it as my heart condition. Mm -hmm. Because if I had like a faulty physical heart or like some strain physically on my heart, I wouldn't be going to run the Boston Marathon. Maybe I could do like a 5K, but I'm not gonna go the full Monty. So for me, it's like, okay, so I do. I have a very sensitive, tender heart that has experienced a lot of challenge in its life. So for me to go forth into relationships knowing what does, knowing what that label is for me, psychologically, then physically and practically, what does that mean? It means I need to be very boundaried with the people I'm letting into my life. So for me, that kind of a label is like, yeah, I probably do have anxious attachment. And so what I do with that is it changes who, how I show up and with whom I'm going to show up. And that almost always across the board looks like incredibly clear boundaries and an incredibly clear sense of what my own values are. And if those things can be honored, 100% I can feel secure in a relationship. That could be in a friendship, a partnership, a working relationship, whatever. I can feel secure because I've now created consciously the parameters within which I feel safe and secure to just be me. Amen as well. I'll throw in just another little side note on it. So if we're expecting our partner to fulfill us in a way that brings us ultimate security, we're always going to be disappointed. Our partners aren't put on this earth to make us content, happy, and peace-oriented. Again, I can't help my pastor side. That's what the Lord is supposed to do for us first. So I do have a great marriage with a woman I completely love 100% for 32 years, but I still don't rely on Angie to bring me a sense of security in my soul. She can affirm me and bless me and encourage me. And we have a oneness relationship. We love to debate and on stupid things as part of our banter and our playful uh, conversation. But deep down, it's that trust that she's going to love me the best she can. And when she doesn't, or when she makes mistakes are a little too sharp, I forgive her. There's grace in the relationship. We talk through it. And when I am so chaotic, I miss three deadlines I was supposed to have for. She forgives me. There's that built-in understanding of the relationship that we fulfill each other even through our humanity. And some of that includes some attachment issues occasionally based on our family of origins, our personalities, or temperaments that will work in variables that we have to uh, be able to move and respond to in a way that is, that is liquid and present and when the past creeps in or a wound creeps in to identify it, talk through it and, and recognize she is not the one who's supposed to make me happy. She's not the one who's the, supposed to make me feel secure or full in life. She can certainly add to it, but it, it's not the context of, oh, if she doesn't make me happier, if she doesn't do this for me, then not only am I disappointed and hurt, but I'm going to make sure she knows it and I'm going to attack her and I'm going to disappoint her and discourage her I i'm getting off on a rabbit trail again but i think you guys know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. yeah i love both of i love what both of you said i completely I, I completely agree with all of it at least there is a power in having a label that then we can know how we need to manage our experience in relationships with more control frankly and more self-compassion and more boundaried experience for sure i love that and elliot i agree at the essence of what you're saying is we don't look to our partner and if we do i don't care what kind of upbringing you've had anyone could have an anxious attachment style if we're looking to our partner to make me happy if you're looking at the partner you, you complete me these kinds of lines from good movies bad lines <laughs> really bad ways of, of of doing life because you set yourself up for failure i always wonder when i'm thinking about anxious attachment with my community, because I think I told you guys, 80% of my, I did a poll, 80% of my community believes they're uh, anxiously attached. 
And I, and that was based on Elliot and my conversation. I wanted to see kind of what they thought and how anxious attachment, if they do believe they have that, how it's played out in their relationships. But my question is, and I, I'd be curious if anyone wants to answer in the, in the little question circle below, when, what is the meaning? So I, I always wonder if someone's anxiously attached, if they are in the first couple months of a relationship, I wonder if they've turned over so much of kind of what Ellie was talking to, so much of like, this has to work because then I'll feel validated. Mm -hmm. This new relationship I'm very excited about, and it's great, get excited. It's super fun in the first couple of months. It's like, oh, the possibility, right? It's, so, that's, oh, that's the best part, the butterflies. But it's also the part where butterflies also can provoke some anxiety, but you can keep that in check if you're not like, this has to work now because I'm getting excited. And then, then you start getting ahead of yourself, in uh, ahead of your skis. And then it's so devastating if it doesn't work out because you've decided that this person now validates you or can invalidate you, right? This person now, this relationship has now taken so much power. You've given it so much power and control. I think if you're behaving in that manner with relationships, there's no way to not have an anxious attachment style. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? I've done this, <laughs> so like, like just from my own personal experience, that devastation happens. And I, if I get really, really clear on emotionally, what am I actually feeling or what is that story I'm actually telling myself? Almost 100% of the time, it's like there was so much on the line. And I like, I was so, you know, again, three years ago, I had a one night relationship with somebody who embodied so many of the characteristics I really hope to be with in a partner, all except for the ghosting. But it was like, I got this glimmer of this person, conscious proof right in front of me. It was so wonderful. We were definitely physically intimate, that messed things up. And then when he disappeared, it was like, but I had so much on the line. Like I was so close to getting what I wanted that when I'm really painfully honest with myself, it's not the loss of the relationship, it's very egoic. It's like, oh, damn it, I almost got what I wanted and it was taken away again, right? And so for me that like my initial response is like coming more from a scarcity mentality. That if you're able to be in this very divine state of mind that like things are constantly unfolding, when I allow them to unfold, I find so much more peace with that process. If I'm trying to exert control or I'm trying to control the outcome or I think that there's one guy in a world of 7 billion people, there's only one man who could be that man for me, then yeah, it's devastating when they don't text you back. But when you can constantly react back to like, okay, well, yes, this is painful. Yes, this is unexpected, but also what can I learn from this? And how can those learnings like facilitate my own deepened trust in the way things are working out? I don't know, that's kind of the direction that that mm -hmm. resonates with for me. Yeah, and I think um, I, I happened to read one of the things going by because I normally don't because I was watching Lee's but uh, it talked about her, um, that her perspective changed when she got some healing there and I think that often when we haven't been cherished, affirmed, blessed, encouraged, truly accepted in an unconditional manner of complete joy and love by a parent and then get into a relationship that shows signs we can get some of that and all of a sudden it alters and changes rather than saying well that you're you know, didn't respond, we still, we go to the self-condemnation and self-blame again. Mm -hmm. And we have that woundedness from our, our, our primal wound from a primary caregiver or mother or father or both or all, see Lisa's book. Um, <laughs> when we have that type of issue going ahead of, ahead of us, we get into that relationship and, and maybe we flip the script and we're in a, we're in a physical relationship, one of those contexts, it doesn't matter the way. But within that realm then, if we're trying to get our partner to fill the parental care and love and affirmation on top of being a great date or build a relationship, it's going to get anxious. It's going to be confusing and it's going really well. And yet somehow we're still disappointed or we're still feeling this lack of fulfillment, mixing our relational needs. Uh, one of your other viewers said about learning to tend needs, which is a great scriptural word. Like you tend to sheep, tend the needs of your partner, rather than trying to fix their needs or give them their needs or meet their needs. I know the language is all popular, but I don't think it's, it's very strong. I am, however, a strong proponent of what I call instant need clarification. 
It'll be coming out in the book, Karen and I are writing next year on marriage, by the way, Lise. I don't know if you knew that's coming. I didn't know that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm just hearing about it myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll pre-order several copies. That? <laughs> With me. But anyway, the concept is called instant need clarification. And so to be able to identify what is the need I'm feeling? What is the need I see or want or desire? And, and we clarify it and then be willing to allow our partner to dance with it on, is that a real need that needs to be dealt with now? Is that a need that should be individualistic or self-determined rather than a need uh, to have in a partnership or a coupleship? Uh, and, and sometimes those needs, when we have that primal wound or that mother or father wound gets so conflute, uh, conflute, conflated, mm -hmm. so much aggravated, we get confused. And, and again, what might be a great relationship gets sidetracked by our own false beliefs, our own negative exposure of narrative. And, and we really got to do some back check and some, some reworking. And so when we know those things are there, please getting some help for the wound itself. So there's not self-sabotage and other story repetition where we're like, see, I knew that person couldn't love me. See, I knew they wouldn't be there for me because partly we set them up not to be. Mm -hmm. And that of course creates all kinds of attachment issues. Yeah. Yeah. The whole uh, setting them up to reinforce what we believe to be true about our us and our experiences and our roles and relationships. Let me grab another question. Um, let's see. Oh, let's see. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Hi guys, how is it possible to have anxious attachment style if one is coming from a very loving home? Hmm. How could, what do you guys think about that? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, your breath came before my breath, so go ahead. So I think then I get really um, fussy and particular about the language. So like in, I'm not a psychologist. I'm pretty sure in psychology, there is like a definition of what anxious attachment look like or what it what it really means right but then there's also just in our vernacular oh what does it mean to be anxiously attached so i would argue in the work that i do which is like all subconscious if you feel like you came from really loving supporting uh supportive family of origin and then maybe it's not an anxious attachment thing because that kind of goes against the definition of what anxious attachment means but it doesn't negate the feeling. So if the feeling is that I feel anxious in my relationships, then that anxiety that you feel in relationships might have nothing to do with your family of origin, but it definitely is giving you feedback about what your current emotional climate reality is. So is there generational stuff that you're hanging on to that needs to be cleared? Is there an old pattern that I don't know comes from a past life that you haven't yet been able to recognize? Is it something about the environment or the company that you're keeping that it doesn't actually feel like an emotionally or neurologically safe environment? That's totally independent of your family of origin. It's just a different kind of anxiety that you're feeling in the context of attachment and relationships. So Great I would point. really I not answering that. <laughs> no, that's good. I, I got two more thoughts on it. <laughs> we can sometimes have such a strong family, it's harder to individuate. And so if our partner, our new partner, is not acting like dad did or doesn't respond like dad did, we might feel, well, this is anxious to me because this isn't how I think strong marriage is supposed to relate. That's why in Scripture in Genesis 2, 24 and 25, the Lord says, we leave our mother and father and cleave to our wife and the two become one flesh. The leaving does not mean we just run away from them or say we hate our parents. I'm thrilled your listener, your follower had a great family. That's awesome. But it doesn't mean we can replicate it. Your, your man didn't come from the same kind of family, even if he had a great family also. So sometimes the context of what we're trying to project in the relationship can build some anxiety that doesn't need to be there if we recognize this relationship can be different. And this relationship have different wrinkles and maybe not the same traditions and maybe not the same styles. So I think sometimes it can be a, uh, a mirror effect. We're trying to see something the exact same. Uh, and that's in the book, Karen, that you haven't started with me yet about the context. Do we come from a matriarchal system or a patriarchal system? Do we come from a family where dad handled the finances or mom handled the finances? And all of a sudden you get into a marriage context where we're like, this is the way it's supposed to be. Men are supposed to handle finances. And, and, and my wife said, since I'm talking about my own marriage, 
my mother handled the finances. I was supposed to handle the finances. So our first fight was on the honeymoon about who was going to keep the money. Right. And, and that, I, that was anxious to me, but it wasn't because I didn't love her. and We didn't have a good attachment. It was different than our family of origin. There was a, the different process involved that can often make it different. A, a second point that came to mind um, as Lisa was talking, and I apologize, I missed the last two sentences you said because I, I switched the gears. Um, there's the whole, the whole element within this attachment is if, if we are, and again, I'm sorry to give women a stronger um, uh, declaration here than I do men. And that's, again, not because I'm proud of my masculine uh, brothers at times. But if a woman doesn't have true commitment from the man she's trying to attach to, she can't feel secure. If he's not exclusive, yeah. if he wants you to just live with him and take care of him, but he won't put a ring on it, and he's not even talking about the ring, uh, and he just keeps dancing you off and pushing you off, uh, a woman is, this is going to sound so old fashioned. I'm sorry, guys, I'm in my 50s. A woman wants the nest and she wants to have that security and she wants to build that, that nestleness. Have you ever heard that term? I think it's a cool term. Just to be able to nestle with her man. And if he's constantly avoiding that full commitment, well, I'm still going to date around other people, or why don't you live with me, or I'm going to treat you like my mom and my sister, but not my wife. Uh, those things will lead to anxious attachment, even if you have a fantastic family of origin. Mm -hmm. Very yeah, the only thing I would add is, as someone, and I know a lot of the women in my community are like me, where, you know, you start dating at 15 like I did, and you don't get married until you're 42, and I had an insanely amazing home, as I speak to, and I'm so blessed and thank God every day for my parents, even my father, who's no longer with us. But life is long and you go through serial monogamy in adulthood and you may have some scars. <laughs> it, it just, you, I don't think we ex escape some of these relationships that are very big heart connections unscathed. Absolutely, you shouldn't. I think it's just, I, it's just part of the woundedness of being part of the Human. humanity. Yes. yes. Yeah. So I would, I would encourage people not to, I mean, yes, we always want to look to our family board and we have to, that's so, that's so wise to look at some of those patterns that we may be repeating in our adult relationships. And also we may look at, man, well, that guy two years ago, I'm still climbing out of that pain. Mm -hmm. And that had nothing to do with your family of origin. But um, yeah, thanks for that. You guys, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I appreciate that. Let's look at another question. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Let's see, um, this is kind of a different one, kind of interesting. How can I keep up with my partner's energy? He's always happy and <laughs> I don't want to ruin it. So I'm guessing this person has a little bit different temperament and she's with a happy-go-lucky type person. Well, my first answer to that is why do you have to, right? She's afraid I, she's gonna ruin it. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. That's, um, again, that's expectations that aren't necessarily healthy. Now, if he has told her, multiple times, which shame on him if he has, that like, oh, you're so low energy that I'm not sure this can continue or giving her kind of conditional shaming like that. Well, then I think all three of us would say, well, you know, park your car somewhere else from now on. <laughs> but, but if there's a context of feeling like, well, I have to be a certain person that's not me in order to be secure with him, then there's some fault lines in that relationship that aren't gonna be strong and healthy. And it doesn't mean you throw it out, but you're gonna have to identify those and work through those. If my wife tried to match my energy, she'd be in the hospital. And I'm not saying that egotistically. My wife's got a ton of giddy up. You know, so I'm, I'm not saying she doesn't get a lot done, but I am chaotically crazy in energy, right? And if I tried to match her structure and her linear organization, I'm going to be in the mental institution, right? So we have to be free to be totally us. And in, to build that secure attachment, we have to accept each other for who we fully are. That's why I told Lisa, I wanted her to swear at least a few times a day. <laughs> it wouldn't have felt right if she didn't swear. You slipped a couple and you didn't even know it. <laughs> we have to be fully us. And that means friendship, you know, for us three too, friendship. It wouldn't be right if I start swearing like crazy, if I go on Lisa's podcast, just trying to fit in with her group. Well, that's not who I am. Well, the same thing is true in the dating relationship. Then this woman, if she doesn't have high, high energy, don't. Don't try to recreate or manufacture. You're not going to be yourself. And you'll build security on something that's not real and not true. I'm, I'm getting really fired up. I'll let Lise get in. <laughs> All I was going to say is like, I just, it's, it's such a direct question, but to ask yourself, how is this a problem? Right? Because sometimes we're like, oh, I should have the same 
as soon as should comes into the conversation, this is like my favorite trope, but to stop the should show. As soon as should is making an appearance, you it, it's already a red flag that you gotta go deeper on something. So like, oh, I don't know how to match my partner's energy. How is that a problem? If it's yeah. a problem, we don't like doing the same things. Okay, there's the problem. That's not an energy difference. That's like a, a difference in interest, right? But yeah. If it's just a matter of, of boundaries or being complimentary to one another, maybe it's maybe it's not even an issue. You just don't have as much energy and you can do other things that you enjoy together differently. Yeah, and and you know, this isn't the topic of the show, but that is definitely true sexually as well. Yeah. We need a podcast about that because I've done so much work in that arena, teaching sexual addiction and helping people counsel through and marriages that are mismatched sexually. And if she's talking about that type of energy, that is a little bit different. And I don't want to go into a nuanced conversation about that, but I'd be glad to if she got a hold of you, Karen, separately, if that's the nuance, because that is, there is some differences there that make that a little bit more important. I would listen to that podcast just saying. <laughs> you might be on it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. All right, let's see. Um, so, um, let's see. Um, so this person says, it's not so much a question. Oh, wait, where'd it go? Oh, wait, there we go. Um, there we go. Yes, because there's a lot of pressure to find the one. Then being on high alert comes in full swing. It's a catastrophic self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. Of So it's just, I think she's saying that early days of, of, of dating, it's like, I got to, I got to find the one. And so putting all that energy and expectation into it. I, and then I, I think she's saying that sometimes that in and of itself can cause it to implode. I think that's what, if that's, if you're still out there, give us more context. If you'd like. <laughs> you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, something comes that in. Right way. I'll, I'll jump in and see if we can meander around to get some thoughts here. But part of that courting process or the stages, the intimacy, and one of your listeners, Karen, wanted us to do a, intimacy podcast because she was really interested in the 10, 12 different intimacy styles I teach in interpersonal relationships rather than just sexual intimacy. Um, if so, if we're talking a little bit about the stages of a relationship, part of this infatuation period, which is healthy and appropriate, we do have some blinders in that time frame, which make the attachment more vulnerable, maybe more uh, uh, intense, but less secure. And it's during the infatuation period when we often, especially in this current culture or generation, uh, we start the sex relationship during the infatuation process, which again, sets the whole thing up for a letdown, mm -hmm. even after the infatua infatuation starts to fade and the true intimacy starts to grow because we compare it then to that embodiment of the excitement and the generational uh, generativity of the sexual bond in this infatuation period it just sets us up for a, a, um, a systemic cultural piece of dissatisfaction. I'm losing what I'm trying to say in the process, but so my thought to the, to the young lady about when we put this pressure on the ideal rather than on the real, then we get confused about the attachment. And I'll shut up for a minute and come back to it if I remember what else I was going. Let me add just a little bit before you jump in, Lee. She says, yes, she's still with us. And she says, yes, she's, she's also speaking to the insecurity around being good enough for the person you're dating. She's adding mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Oh, look out now. <laughs> and that, and that, that, I feel like that's a, a, a different direction entirely, right? Because if that anxiety is popping up, wearing that uh, veil of insecurity and am I, am I for this person, that's not anxious attachment. That is an invitation to go deeper and figure out where those feelings are coming from. Like really, really and truly. And you know, Elliot, at the beginning you said, like I have a fear of being too much for somebody. I do and I don't. I feel like the right person for me will just be also so wonderful that it won't mm -hmm. even cross my mind that I'd be too much for somebody, right? If I'm too much for somebody, it's the same as saying that I'm not enough for somebody. Absolutely. So have those feelings of like, well, maybe I'm just too much. I, I think actually this friend is here. I have a, a, a great friend who not too long ago was like, I'm afraid you're not gonna meet anybody as wonderful as you. And I was like, oh, this is an invitation to go deeper with what that really means. And, and I can't believe that that could be true. I sat with it for a while. I can't believe that could be true. But it really made me go inside and feel like, do I still have lingering threads of not enoughness? Mm -hmm. because if that not enoughness 
is present, that is the feedback to go in and figure out, likely with the help of a professional, to figure out what would make me feel like that's enough. Like what wounds do need some attention and some healing that I can feel secure in who I am, that I do belong to myself, that I am enough for me, and that is also enough that anybody else really is just a bonus. Amen to that. And a, a wrinkle off that to add maybe some more depth to it. If you feel some security in who you are and you've done some work holistically and the partner or man or woman is making you feel constantly that you're not good enough, well, then there might be an inequality in the validation, affirmation, equation. They might have some issues about you're never going to be good enough for them, no matter how good you are. And you got to identify and analyze the relationship as a whole and not just, again, throw the guy away or throw the gal away, but have some discussions with them about, hey, this is the reality of how I'm feeling. Can we talk through this? Can we maybe even go to a joint session and talk to someone about this context that's creating this insecurity in me when I think I'm doing the best I can and yet it doesn't seem enough. I'm not blaming the partner or the man involved in this scenario, but there could be some need besides the self-reflection and, and checks of the insecurity to, to do a kind of a quick check or oil change on the relationship itself. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. She gave us a little feedback. She said, that's beautiful. It makes me think deeper. Thank you so much for the question and for the feedback. We have just five minutes left in our hour. We're going to get to a few more questions. When, if we don't get to all the questions, how about go to my website? I have an ask a question tab. You can type in your question, put in there, Lisa and Elliot, and that way we'll know, we'll hang on to them. I'm guessing we're going to need to do this again, people. <laughs> Just saying, if you're up, oh, if you're up for it. Um, so let's, like I said, let's hit a couple more questions. And then if, if we didn't get to you, we want to make sure we do have an opportunity to answer a question because you guys are coming with a lot of deep, deep concerns that are so legitimate. And we just want to do everything we can to be here for you and honor your heart. And we want to thank you for your heart and being here today. So just a couple more before we go. Um, someone asked, Will you be covering avoidant attachment sometime soon? I feel like I have the opposite mm. issue in that I struggle between, let me finish it, wanting to be independent and connected to someone. Okay, I did do one post um, in some of my little graphics that I posted this week that gives you the traits of avoidant attachment. But um, take it away, folks. We can certainly talk to this, speak to this at some point, yes. The, answer, the, the overall answer is yes, and now, continue. <laughs> Yeah, in three minutes or less. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, do I, how do I frame this in a way? Uh, I'll just say that all attachment issues are rooted in the same things. Um, and as if you listen, go back and find the Father Wound and the Mother Wound podcast, I talk about how they produce different styles of attachment, attachment vulnerabilities. But absolutely, yes, we can, we can avoid the attachment and make ourselves anxiously attached or avoid on purpose and sabotage again. I, I go back to that equation. I don't know if I created it or not, but I think I did. It'll be in the book that Karen's going to learn about soon. Uh, belief plus expectations equals fulfillment. And so if we believe we're not worthy and, and therefore we expect not to be attached and not to be securely loved, then we can avoid heading into that intimacy circle. We'll just stay on the outside and dance around. And then we're avoidingly attached. That's a very simple look at it. But again, the belief plus what we expect, that equals fulfillment to me. I love that. I have nothing that I can add to that. <laughs> Except join us when we talk about it more yeah. succinctly and analytically. All right. Well, let me see if I can get a couple more then. Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Keep no. talking while I'm looking for. Just like a, a, a promo. Like, it was, I only know Elliot through listening to those conversations on the mother wound and the father wound. And like, they are such powerful, generous conversations and information. I really, really highly recommend everybody listen to those two, two episodes in particular. Thank you so much for that endorsement. Yeah. And someone else I just saw um, that was girl uh, had left a comment said that those episodes in particular were really helpful for her. Um, so I think uh, this is kind of something a little bit different. And so... Lee, by the way, I got to throw one thing into Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to do an episode soon with Karen on the divorce wound. Oh, amen. Yeah, I'm dealing with it more and more in some couple of counseling scenarios. So my heart's getting triggered. 
And it's such a conversation to have because to normalize that it is a wound. Absolutely. The trauma that it gets written off as a failure. And I will say, not that you asked for my opinion, but I'm obviously going to give it to you right now. Yes. That if you are a woman and you are left, it was your fault. If you were a woman and you do the leaving, oh, it was your fault. Like there's so much emotional labor involved in divorce, in addition to the concentric rings of loss it leaves in its wake, that the more healthy, positive conversations we have about divorce so we can like, you know, bring the flashlight under the bed and find out there were no monsters there all along. I am really, really, really in support of. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously I will bring experience of counseling hundreds of divorced couples, but it would be great to, great to have your insight and input as a divorced woman. That would be helpful to have both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this question, sometimes we know who we want, but we also know that it's never going to happen. How mm -hmm. should it go? Oh my. <laughs> These are hard questions to answer very quickly. Like that's, I can tell you the, the abridged version of, I don't know, 40 years of acquired wisdom radical acceptance i have been wildly in love with people that i knew it wasn't going to happen and the only reason it was painful is because i couldn't quite accept that it, it was not in the cards having recovering or you know old patterns of codependency and people pleasing i was going to find a way come hell or high water and subconsciously it made me feel really safe and secure to keep finding a way and to keep like showing him what a great wife i would be right and when i could and Sometimes this is easier than others. Usually it's very difficult when I could wrap my head around accepting like, oh, this isn't going to work and I can accept that. That's the freedom part. So it's like, I don't know, invest in, invest in therapy, coaching, whatever it is that you can, you can give yourself permission to find that acceptance. And that acceptance is what allows you to, let, to honor your feelings and also let it go. Here's what I found. <laughs> Nothing yeah. on my point. I think she nailed it. Yeah, she nailed it. You guys, we are at an hour in, so we're going to wrap up. Like I said, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your concerns, your deep woundedness, and your heart with us. And we hope that we've been able to honor in this space, honor who you are. We Everything we do is for you guys. And so we <laughs> just appreciate you guys showing up today. I'm going to save this. We'll disseminate it on our platforms. And then, like I said, I'll throw it over on YouTube as well. If you're on my email list, I'm going to try to see if I can upload it to my next newsletter, which I'm going to send out later today. Lise Elliott, let people know where you are, what you have for them to offer them. LiseWilcox.com on Instagram. I'm at Lise Wilcox, which is L-E-I-S-S-E. -S -S -E. I have two books that are currently available. One just came out, which I, I know you will love, and it's called Alone, The Truth and Beauty of Belonging, which is so much of this conversation. Fuck. Uh, I don't remember the name of my <laughs> Instagram at Pastor Elliot. Yes, you're Pastor Elliot Anderson. <laughs> Pastor, okay, thank two you. Two L's, two T's. Yeah, two L's and two T's. Um, and I am a, I'm a writer as well as Lisa and Karen are. And my first book, and I don't think we've ever had this on podcast. Uh, my first book was all about ten years of infertility. Angie and I wrestled through and accepting the infertility, and then choosing adoption, and then, you know at-risk kids and then two more babies so four babies in two years and 15 days um and the explosion of that that was my first book and, and then my second book was about my father uh which we talked about in the father wounds how my dad grew through significant significant mother and father wounds to be a tremendous father though he wrestled with intimacy his whole life um he, he learned how to at least give to others what he sometimes couldn't give himself uh, and then I write romance novels. So I've written one romance novel that was out last year called It's About Time. The second one will be out by Christmas. Um, and it's called The Return Home. And um, it, it go goes into my crisis therapy background and a single mother and a heroin uh, addict and all kinds of good stuff. But uh, they're stories of redemption. People ask me, why do I write romance novels? Because so much of my life is dealing with the really difficult, painful things in life helping people walk through them. And when I can orchestrate a novel to have a lot of really happy endings and wonderful love and romance, it's great cathartic therapy for me. Uh, and then I've had such great feedback. Lots of people said, wow, and I think Karen, you said the same thing. This is actually pretty good. So uh, <laughs> I joined writing those as well. And then the marriage book called Negotiating the Bonds of Love, 
is what I've been working on for a while. Now I'm having Karen come in to add the research piece and old marriage versus new married, simply meaning I got married early, Karen got married older, uh, adding some other opportunities to go in there and um, be able to see what the Lord does with that as well. Thank you. Yeah, and my podcast is Love and Life with Dr. Karen, and these two are special guest stars on the regular, they're fan favorites. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I think, oh, like I said, again, if, you, if we didn't get the chance to answer your question, please head over to my website. There's an Ask a Question tab. You can type out your question. Let me know that you're specifically wanting Lisa and Elliot to address it, though. And then we will, we'll, I'll print those out. And then the next time we get together, we'll be sure that your question is the first, questions are the first that we address. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank you. Love to all. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.